hi guys and welcome to the show today something a little bit different I thought well I got up extremely early I'm heading to the bank now I wanted to get all my work done for the day and if you see I'm in Queens this is where I live basically this is my street rather suburban quiet leafy crazy to think uh, just over the river it's the madness of Manhattan so what we're gonna do today I'm gonna take you to some of my favorite places in New York City uh, we're going to talk about the Rolex Explorer. I can't believe it's been a year since I uh, bought that watch. And also I've got some very important news. So firstly, I'm going to go to the bank. I haven't done wristwatch check. Let me just do that. Rolex Explorer. No, sorry. <laughs> Rolex uh, Submariner. Uh, basically, I do things a little bit differently. I keep most of my watches in the bank, as you can imagine why. So uh, I keep a few out in rotation. So I'm going to go to the bank, hopefully I might smuggle the camera in and uh, you see the very impressive safe. So I'm going to do that first, get the Explorer out and then head to the city. Join me in my garden. What are those? What are those people trespassing? Now this is uh, Central Park. I wish it was my garden. This is one of my favourite places to come in New York, especially the summer. New York's fantastic for the museums in the winter. We'll get to that in just a moment. Uh, I want to share with you a special little hidden gem uh, away from the tourists. And I think, um, well, I've been coming here for almost a decade. Well, no. Yeah, a decade now. Central Park is absolutely ginormous. You really need a couple of days to get the most out of it. In the southern part, it's more touristy. I'm here at the Northern Meadow, uh, which back in the day used to be absolutely desolate uh, when I first arrived to New York. Now there's, you know, there's locals, you'll hear plinking sound of people uh, playing bas uh, not basketball, actually the basketball courts are over there um, behind the camera is the base the baseball fields and you can see people cycling there you go there's some <laughs> there's some the civilians cycling um yeah i used to bike over queensboro bridge do two laps and then bike home and i got un unbelievably fit um physically fit oh and we're joined by the nypd there they, there they go <laughs> it's the nypd um, I'm, I'm going off on a tangent. Sorry, I get excited. I, I, I adore this place. It's my one of my favorite places. Um, so, talking of favorite places, let's uh, switch perspectives and have a look at the gardens. I think there's the English garden, there's the French garden, and what is it? Oh yeah, the Italian garden. How can I forget? So let's have a look now. It's a fantastic place to go, get away from the hustle and bustle. Uh, sometimes you forget you're in this uh, metropolis. Uh, so yeah, let's take a look at that. Before we take a look at my favorite part of the park, a little bit of an overview. Central Park is one of the most visited urban parks in the United States. It's the fifth largest park in New York City and covers 843 acres. And it spans from 59th Street all the way up to 110th Street, established in 1857. It's an astonishing achievement by landscape architect Frederick Law Olmsted. A staggering 40 million people visit the park every year. Now, if you want a good overview, there's a fantastic article on loving New York City. Uh, that gives you a top 10 list of the more touristy areas. These can all be found in the southern section of the park, uh, including Strawberry Fields, Sheep's Meadow, uh, of course, the very iconic rowboat. Uh, there's the Central Park Zoo. And in winter, there's also ice skating, etc. Many of these you'll recognize from numerous films. And quite rightly so, the, the views and, and um, setting is, is 
quintessentially New York. And what I like to do is I like to go up Fifth Avenue. And along Fifth Avenue, you'll find three of the world's greatest art museums, um, definitely three of my personal favorites. East 70th Street, you will find the Frick Collection, uh, which is a building dedicated to Henry Clay Frick's personal and incredibly impressive collection. I visited there recently. If you follow me on Instagram, you would have seen that. Then, of course, we have the Metropolitan Museum of Art, which is one of the world's largest art galleries. An astonishing collection of, well, you need a good couple of days um, alone in that place. It's certainly one of my favorites, up there with the V&A, the British Museum. And then perhaps one of the most instantly recognizable, of course, the Guggenheim, beautiful spiral art gallery uh, designed by Frank Lloyd Wright. It really is a majestic, magical, uh, I, I personally, I find the building almost as interesting as the art inside. Utterly unique and distinctive, nothing quite like it in the entire world. And lastly, we have the Museum of the City of New York, uh, which is mainly history, but also uh, a ton of great art as well, quite literally opposite uh, the gardens we're about to visit. Now, separating the North Park is the Jackie Onassis Reservoir. And if you've followed my uh, series on watches in movies, you'll recognize um, the opening scene of Marathon Man with Dustin Hoffman jogging around this park and the finale in that uh, little um, water pumping station at the far side. Now it, this view is taken from the north and I think it offers the best views of the cityscape which is really uh, illustrates just how massive this park is. There there I am, the pillock doing a, <laughs> a wristwatch check um, as the joggers go past and if you ever get lost you can always use the San Remo Towers on West 74th beautiful Art Deco 1930s landmark um, no matter where you are in the park you can always a bit like a, a north guiding star but located basically on the west now located on 104th to 106th Street uh, on the east side is this beautiful gated entrance to one of my favorite parts of the park, the Conservatory Gardens. And it's split into essentially three areas. And as we see here, this grand, um, reminds me actually of the Giardino di Bobili in Florence, this uh, beautiful fountain. And this of course is the Italian Gardens. As I like to use it, a, a romantic place to take the wife. And we have the English Gardens. Unfortunately, the flowers had already bloomed, so we missed uh, the, the, the roses and all the rest of it. And then last of all, we have the French garden, uh, which is a little bit more rustic, hidden away with lots of uh, trees. And, and that was still very much in full bloom, not in full bloom, but uh, we had a beautiful array. There's some foxgloves. It's probably my personal favorite because there's just tons of little hidden uh, nooks and crannies where you can find a quiet bench. and quite astonishingly it's always overlooked and pretty much only used for locals great place to cool off uh, especially on a hot day like today absolutely magical and uh, very very romantic so what did you guys think pretty cool huh and it's completely free um, you can see why I adore this place and yeah, summertime, this is essential. If you come to New York in the summertime, you've got to come here. There's so much to do, so much to do. Anyway, I thought I'd share with you the Revolution magazine has finally come in with my interview. Um, I better turn around again because it's a bit difficult to hold the camera. My arm is dying. <laughs> so here it is. And um, thank you so much to Sophie for sending it in. So this is what issue? issue number 25. Got a beautiful uh, Breguet Tourbillon on the front. It's fitting because we have a fantastic article uh, in time for my one year anniversary of the Explorer. 65 years of evolution. There's old Fleming. Got my Fleming on. Uh, there we go. There's his. Do have a look. Oh my God. It's just watch pornography of the highest order. Oh, look at that. 
1650, very nice. Probably my favorite, the, um, sorry, there's my hairy leg, I apologize. <laughs> 1016, that's it, absolutely gorgeous. I did consider going for one of those, but the prices are absolutely ridiculous. There we go, oh, and there's mine. Anyway, fantastic magazine, let's, let's get to the, to the main event, shall we? Now, who's that handsome devil, huh? <laughs> who's, who's this jammy bugger? Oh, I should, I'm not sure if bugger is a, a swear word, but anyway. There he is, look, look at that. In my turtleneck, of course. There's me and Mr. Parmigiani. There we go. There's me and uh, Romain Gautier. Yeah, so there we go. Anyway, pick up a copy. I'm gonna frame this and put this on the wall. I'm gonna take it back to the studio now because I, I, there is a bit of a breeze. I mean, it's fantastically hot and the, the breeze is quite welcomed. Uh, it's rather refreshing actually, but uh, I'm not sure if it's going to muck up the sound. Um, so let's change perspectives, take it back to the studio and I will discuss one year with this bad boy. The Fleming, oh the Explorer. Yeah, it might just be my favourite watch of all time. Bold statement, bold statement. Yeah, hold that thought, let's take it back to the studio and we'll discuss it. I have discussed the history of the Explorer. I'll leave a link so have a look back. I've also compared it to the larger, later 39mm. Have a look at that if you're interested. That's more, you know, measurements, calibers, all the rest of it. I really want to talk about how the watch has made me feel, how it's changed my perception. Uh, and I did this in my six month update. Um, I, I don't want to go over the same the same uh, because I, I essentially I haven't changed my, my my feeling for this watch hasn't changed I still think it's the classiest Rolex ever made in my opinion you know don't get upset at me uh, I also think it's my favorite Rolex it's made me question my other Rolexes in fact it's made me question <laughs> a lot of watches for a little while I was considering maybe I should get the 1016, the 1016 being the predecessor to this. It ran from 1963 all the way to 1989. By many purists, it is the quintessential explorer, the choice of Fleming, etc. It is absolutely gorgeous. The only problem is the price. I mean, those are going for, you know, what, four times, five times even the price of this, which is just ridiculous because, I mean, Okay, I understand the hype, but it's, in many ways, it's an inferior watch because at least the loom works on this. Looking at the calibers, it originally came with the 1530, which wasn't COSC certified, interestingly enough. And that then um, got replaced with the COSC certified 1560. Quite interestingly, ran at a slower speed of, I think, 18,000. Ultimately, I think the last caliber was the 1570, which ran a little bit faster at 19,000. Um, this obviously runs at 28,800, where you could argue that the slower speed boosts its longevity, you know, less friction in the moving parts. I've, I've said that many, many times, and it's true. Um, and I found this interesting discussion online. I, I had to print it out because it was quite fascinating. And I'll, I'll quote you, this is a discussion by, by, between two watchmakers uh, and this, this is a testament to how nerdy it gets, right? A less complicated movement has less chance of things going wrong. And it's something I do appreciate about the lack of date. Less parts, less chance of things going wrong, etc. If that thinking is correct, uh, then the 1570 is even simpler. Um, it has a greater degree of hand-built construction and the steel used back then was of a higher grade. Several people say in the forums that perhaps the 1570 was a superior movement. The 3130 that my Rolex has, very similar architecture, you know, the trusted traits of the Rolex calibers. NYPD, of course. Thank you guys, thank you guys. <laughs> they interrupted me in the park and now back in Queens. Anyway, I would say they are equally rugged and reliable. And then someone um, responds and says, I have read reports from very respected watchmakers that the 15,000 uh, series of movements 
are over-engineered workhorses. My own experience mirrors that. I have found them to be amazingly strong, capable of withstanding a huge amount of punishment. Interestingly, some watchmakers say that the 3035 seem to wear quicker than other movements. Not sure if that's true. I mean, you know, people have different experiences with different calibers but guys do let me know what your thoughts if there are any watchmakers uh, that have worked on rolex calibers what are your thoughts is the 15,000 superior to the the later 31 um, 30 uh, calibers maybe my claim that the not my claim but my thoughts that the 16 uh, sorry i'm getting all, the, all the, these numbers these ruddy numbers the 1016 is an inferior, well, okay, certainly when it comes to loom with the tritium loom, it doesn't have the super luminova. Did have the, uh, the sapphire, I think. Um, and they're both 100 meters water resistant with the, with the oyster case, etc. So the difference really isn't that much. My biggest fear is the risk of franking watches, you know, um, non original parts or replaced hands or replaced dials. Uh, restored dials, that kind of thing. Obviously, my dream would be the 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 uh, what was it? The uh, the space dweller it was yeah, the space dweller. If you remember, I did the video about these extremely rare Japanese market explorers that they tried to remarket it and take it in a different direction. Very interesting story. Have a look back at that video. Of course, those <laughs> you know. Uh, you'd, you could buy a house or a deposit for a house with the, the cost of those. But anyway, so maybe I think this is, this is the one. Everything I said in that six month update is still happening despite, you know, my little flirtations with the thought of a 1016. I just can't justify spending even, I think, four grand for what these are going for on the used market, I think is... Uh, too much. I get the hype with the the Pepsi. I get the hype with the Submariner. Just don't think it's justified when it comes. This is a very at the end of the day, it's a, it's a three hander, still watch. I mean, I get yeah the power of Rolex, but at the same time, I do uh, appreciate the fact that I can sell it at any time. Not that I will. Ah, the the ups and downs of the Rolex. However. There is something very interesting that this watch has done that my Submariner and my G uh, Pepsi has not, the Hoffman. For a while I considered selling the Submariner. I can't travel because I've, uh, at the moment, for another year because I've got a big uh, work contract looming and uh, a few exciting developments with the channel. I can't, my lips are sealed. So I'm gonna do the Japan trip next year. Funny thing is, I never for a split second consider selling the Explorer. Uh, which is remarkable considering the Submariner has such a strong sentimental, you know, I bought it for my 30th. That is, a, it is, uh, <laughs> just shows you how besotted I am with this watch and I don't wear it enough. Um, it's been in the, the bank safe for a couple of weeks now. I'm gonna make more effort to wear it. It's summertime now. I have such fun with the straps. I love its versatility. I love its stealth. You know, you never get the question, oh, is that a Rolex? The only people that know this is a Rolex are watch people. Understated, very conservative size, built like a tank, can take a lot of punishment. And another thing that's really interesting, the Explorer gives me much more of that Bond feel than my Submariner ever does, or the countless, endless amounts of Seamasters. Um, and I've said it, it's, it, in my opinion, it's the original Bond watch. It's what Fleming wore. And in recent years, I really came to appreciate Fleming more, watching documentaries about him, reading about him. Also that series on Netflix, which the man who would be Bond with, uh, I forget his name, ter terrific British actor, Dominic. Oh, what was his name? Somebody fill me in in the comments, please. But yeah, really made me appreciate how much of Fleming went into Bond and the story behind it. So if Commander Bond was real, I, I think I could see him with an explorer. I really could. Sorry, Bond fans, please don't uh, assassinate me, but uh, or garrot me with, uh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> a cheese wire coming out of a Submariner. But yeah, um, which begs the question, what gadgets could you put in an explorer? Well, you couldn't really. I love it, I love it. It's, it's my favorite Rolex. 
and it's got me considering selling my, my Pepsi. You know, with Pepsi mania going on right now, it might, might be a good idea. I do kind of regret selling the oyster bracelets and I know I'm gonna hear a million, uh, oh, I told you TGB, I told you TGB. Uh, funny thing is, I don't regret selling it with the Pepsi I wear it on a Jubilee. I, I bought a terrible 70s, even older than the Pepsi itself. A stamped Jubilee bracelet. My Submariner with the with the glide lock. Unfortunately, it doesn't work on this. Another possible regret is maybe I should have saved up and got the latest version with the luminescent on the numerals. I do like the way this plays with the light with the applied nine, three, and six. Thinking about the ten, sixteen, I kind of want the lume in the numerals, but. You know, it's, it's not the end of the world. I'm, I'm chuffed to bits with this. It has everything I want in a Rolex, but without the luxury branding and all the, the, the negative sides of Rolex. And I've said this before, it's the do it or watch. I could dress it up with a strap, wear it with a tux. I know it's a faux pas, but can you blame me? even more bond. I mean, what is more bond than that? It still has the value retention, still has the allure, the sense of adventure that my Submariner has. And it's so funny because when I first got into watches, I considered the Explorer boring. Um, it has this slow release charm to it. It just goes to show how tastes change, how we grow as collectors. One year on, it's pure class. It's my favorite watch. Oh, but bold words, bold words. But yeah, it's, it's, it's me. It is me. Um, and it's made me think, do I really need to own any other watches? Which is interesting because the Submariner nev never made me think that. The Submariner, I love the Submariner, I love the Pepsi, but I still want other watches. This, I put this on and I kind of think, oh, What's the, do I, need, do I need to buy other watches? No watch has done that. I guess that is true love, true love. I'm a polygamist when it comes to other watches, but with this, it's, uh, I, yeah. Oh, and I'm getting a round of applause. The Mozart's over. Perfect time to end the video. Um, I will do more exploring Central Park. It's so big that, that, Quite frankly, I need two days to explore it. I'll do the southern part in another video, but stay tuned. Thank you so much for watching. Please let me know your thoughts. What is your favorite Rolex? And let me know what your favorite watch is. I think I found mine. Anyway, guys, I'm gonna leave it there. Thank you so much for watching. Please don't forget to add your thoughts, queries, comments, all the rest of it down below, and I will catch you in the next one. Okay, ciao.